Okay, so this morning we're looking at Acts 5. We've been working through the book of Acts over the last few weeks and we've reached a point, an interesting point. This is a very interesting chapter, um, which I have to say has been a real challenge to think about and um, yeah, grapple with really this week. Um, but I wanted to start with a question really. Have you ever wanted to be seen to be doing something, but your heart really wasn't in it? Have a think. Have you ever wanted to be seen to be doing something, but your heart wasn't really in it? I'll give you an example. So new year came, I made a new year resolution. Well, I make millions, I never keep them, but I make millions. I love making new year's resolutions, feel so good. And I decided this is the year, Ben was laughing as I even said it, that I'm gonna become really fit. I'm gonna get really fit. I'm gonna do loads of exercise. I'm gonna really do it this year. And Ben was just nodding, yes, 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 of course you will. And so I signed up for this Davina McCall. Do you know Davina McCall, this fitness app? Um, and she's very motivational, you know, and she gave me this speech on New Year's Day saying, this will be the year when you will do it. And I signed up and basically you're given challenges every day that you're meant to do. And then you uh, sign up for the app and this whole community of other people who are trying to get fit can all see what you're doing and they can all see your progress. And they all put videos of themselves up showing themselves doing all this stuff. And their, their challenge numbers are going up and their calorie being burnt are going up. And oh my goodness, it's horrendous. <laughs> So I got to sort of two weeks into January and I had a big fat zero sitting next to my name on this profile. And I thought, oh no, I have to do this. So I started doing one of the workouts. Well, it was 40 minutes long and it was some combat thing where you had to punch the air about a million times. And by 22 minutes into this thing, I was nearly dead. And I, I just couldn't continue. I couldn't complete the challenge, but I was so exhausted and I was so ashamed of this big fat zero that was next to my name that I did something really naughty and I, t I, I ticked the completed challenge box next to my I know this is a confession next to my name and you know what as soon as I did it I knew it was wrong and I knew I had cheated the system and I had felt I'd left let Davina down I'd let myself down I'd let God down and you know, I tried to get it back. I tried to unclick it and I couldn't, I couldn't unclick it. And that one felt like it was condemning me. You know, every time I looked at it, I knew I'm not really, I'm not really deserving of this one. I should still have a big fat zero next to my name. I have cheated the system. Have you ever done anything like that? Maybe it's just me. But you know, sometimes we, we say yes to something and we aspire to something. We really do. We really long to be a certain way but we really can't put our heart into the process of getting there. You know, we used to do something um, when we were growing up, maybe many of you still do this, if you're children, the hokey cokey. And the hokey cokey used to be a big thing in the 80s, you know, church parties and children's parties. And I, I would love the beginning of the hokey cokey, you know, when it's just quite at a distance and it's just one hour in and one hour out and it's shake it all about and it's fine. But I absolutely hated the end bit where you had to put your whole self in because there were always violent boys jumping around and someone would stand on my foot and someone would jostle me and I really didn't like it. But I was smiling on the outside, but inside I was just wincing and just wishing it was over because putting your whole self in is really uncomfortable, isn't it? And you know, God has been really challenging me through this passage, which is probably the reason why I was supposed to be talking about it, that actually this, is, this holiness business is really difficult, isn't it? It's really uncomfortable, it's really challenging because we're called to put our whole self in, as the Hokey Cokey song says, that's what it's all about, but it's not easy. And I want to read um, from the end of actually chapter four this morning into fact, into chapter five because there's a real contrast being presented to us at the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five and i just want to focus on those so let's read together acts 4 32 if you've got your bible with you acts 4 32 all the believers were one in heart and mind no one claimed that any of his possessions were his own but they shared everything they had with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. 
From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the seals and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Wow. <laughs> this is one of the hardest passages, I think, to get our heads around, isn't it? In the New Testament, we would expect this kind of thing maybe in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we're not used to this. And if I'm honest, I would probably prefer if the story had a different ending. If I could choose my own ending, I wouldn't have chosen that one. I would have had Ananias and Sapphira just confess their sin. There would have been a lovely moment of repentance and forgiveness and restoration. And it would be a lovely story of grace and mercy. But that's not the story that we're given. And I don't fully understand and I don't pretend to understand why there's this swift, irreversible judgment that comes on these two, especially in the company of Peter, because we know Peter was the guy who denied knowing Jesus three times, but experiences this amazing grace and forgiveness from Jesus. And we know that Paul killed lots of Christians when he was Saul, but he received forgiveness and restoration and lots of grace. So why is this different? What was so bad about what they did? Was it that they were greedy? Was it that they didn't give all of the money? Well, no, we know that wasn't the reason because there was no obligation for them to do that at that time. It was voluntary for the apostles to do that. So no, it wasn't about greed. It wasn't about the money. Peter says this, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. This is all about the heart. When I was talking to my life group about this, Henny and Becca said that to me, you know, this is all about the heart and they're absolutely right. Ananias and Sapphira have lied to the Holy Spirit. They've deliberately lied to God and their heart has become filled, not with the Holy Spirit, but allowed Satan to get a foothold and fill their hearts. Now, some theologians talking about this say, well, were Ananias and Sapphira true believers? They believe they weren't. They believe they were Pharisees who were trying to infiltrate the early church and destroy it. But most theologians say, no, they were true believers, but they opened themselves up to be filled by something other than the Holy Spirit. They gave Satan a foothold in their lives because their hearts were not fully surrendered to God, because their hearts were divided. Now, this 
striking down is very similar to something that happens in the Old Testament in Joshua 7. There's a, an account of the new children of Israel after the destruction of Jericho. They've gone, gone into the promised land and there's this occasion where some of the precious devoted things, they're called some gold, some silver, some robes, are stolen by a, a man called Achan. And God tells the leaders of the community that Achan and his family have got to be destroyed because they have taken something that was devoted to God. It was meant for God's divine service and they've taken it for their own glory, for their own service. And there is a parallel between what happens here in this account and what happens there in the Old Testament. And Tom Wright, who I really love um, his insights into passages like this, he has so much wisdom. He says the reason that these things are paralleled is because in the Joshua case, there was a new little fledgling community. There was a new little community that was being established and God was jealously protecting that community. It was like a tender shoot. You know, we can see the little tender shoots coming in our garden at the minute, daffodils and, and the bluebells are poking up. They're tender, they're fragile. And God was jealously protecting his, his new community. And in this environment, the church had just been established, hadn't it, in chapter two. We're only in chapter five. This church was very fragile. This was newly established and God was jealously guarding his church. He was not wanting the devil to get a foothold in the hearts and minds of the believers. So even though it's so hard to understand and it doesn't quite tally and I don't pretend that I have my head around it, but there is this sense that it was for the greater good to protect God's church that this happened. Now, I didn't feel like I needed to focus this morning on all the whys and wherefores of that, because as I say, I'm not a theologian and I don't understand it. And actually, God said to me, Esther, this morning's not about the head, it's all about the heart. And what we do know from this passage is that God sees our hearts. You know, we know that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And in a way, Acts 4 and then 5 presents us with a tale of two hearts, doesn't it? A tale of two kingdoms, a tale of two ways to live. We've got this beautiful picture of Barnabas and the believers, and their hearts are devoted, aren't they? But Ananias and Sapphira, their hearts are divided. We've got Barnabas giving his field all the money to God. He is surrendered. He is all in. And Kath gave me that word earlier in the week for this passage, surrender. And I was so grateful to her because that really opened it up to me. Yeah, Barnabas and the believers were surrendered. But Ananias and Sapphira, their heart is still shackled. It's still caught in this trap of wanting and grasping for themselves. Barnabas is trusting fully. But Ananias and Sapphira, they're hustling. They're hustling, they're jostling. They're still trying to do stuff in their own strength. And Barnabas, I don't have time to go into his amazing life. I would love to talk on that sometime because he is one of my massive heroes of the Bible. Unsung hero, I think, Barnabas. Look at his legacy. Barnabas gives all he has. He is all in. He is a person who is sold out for God. The field was just the beginning of it with Barnabas. The field was the beginning of it. He gives his money, he gives his field, but he gives his life for the gospel. He's the man who encourages the disciples to believe that, that Paul is a good guy. He risks his reputation, he risks his money, his financial security, he risks his life. He ends up being martyred in Cyprus where he was born at the end of his life, giving his life fully for the gospel. He runs fundraising um, missions to help the believers when they're starving. Um, he is incredible doing one of the first missionary journeys with Paul. Oh my goodness, his life legacy is incredible. And it started in the small things. It started with a field. Ananias and Sapphira, their life is snuffed out. They have no legacy. Who knows what God was birthing in them? Who knows what they could have gone and done? It's a real tragedy for them. Their legacy is snuffed out. And I want to ask ourselves, and these are hard questions that I've been having to grapple with while thinking about this talk. This is painful stuff. Who do we relate to more? This morning, can we relate more to Barnabas or we can relate more to Ananias and Sapphira? And I know who I can relate more to. The theme of the heart is so important throughout the whole Bible, isn't it? Right from the Old Testament, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Our first question this morning is, is our heart devoted or is it divided? 
Is it devoted or is it divided? Our heart is where our thoughts, our feelings, our motives, our desires spring from. In the New Testament, Philippians 4 says, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We've got to be alert to what we're allowing to enter and dwell in our hearts, because who we become is a result of the state of our hearts in the small things. Who we become starts in the small, the small choices, the small decisions, the small yes and the small no. Ananias and Sapphira, their heart is divided between pleasing God and pleasing themselves, between building God's kingdom and building their own kingdom, between basking in their own glory and giving glory to God. They still need to be seen to be doing the right things. They still are falling for those little whispers of Satan that saying, you need to be recognized for this, you need some credit for this, you need to be seen to be doing good. Jesus preaches on this in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, he condemns those who give like Ananias and Sapphira to be seen by men. And he says in Matthew 6, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And what we're treasuring in the small things, in the small moments is just as important as those big, huge life stages and life milestones. What do we treasure in that secret place? James 4 says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And he warns that this double-mindedness, this divided heart is dangerous. It leads to a path of destruction. And it's described like being, you know, a wave just tossed on the sea. When we're double-minded, we're not anchored, we're floating, we're drifting, and we can be taken far from where God wants us to be. So our first question this morning is, are our hearts divided or are they devoted? The next one is, is our heart trusting or is it hustling? I find it hard to trust stuff. You know, even on water slides, I get blisters on my hands from holding onto the side to stop myself going too fast. I hate losing control. I got arm cramp holding my babies. They were in slings. I didn't trust the slings. I, I literally would be holding them because I couldn't trust what they were designed to do. I thought this sling is gonna get, let me down. My baby's gonna fall. And we do that with so many things in our lives, don't we? We hold on tight and trusting is literally that letting go of that tightly clenched fist and letting God take over in the small, in the day-to-day -day things and in the big life decisions as well. The word hustle, I didn't realize, comes from the Dutch word, which means to shake, to jostle. And it's a sense of hurriedly pushing something along in our own strength hurriedly pushing something along in our own strength. We're controlling, we're striving, we're manipulating. Trusting means we're not relying on our own strength. We're doing it in God's strength, in his ability. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, the Bible says, and lean not on your own understanding. Barnabas clearly trusts God to provide for his needs and he's able to hand over the field, hand over the money, hand over his life as a result. But Ananias and Sapphira, they have a field. They have resources that they could choose to use whatever way they want. And they could have been really honest to the community. They could have gone and said, fessing up, I've given 80% of the money I got from this field and I've kept 20 to myself. And that would have been okay. But they didn't, did they? They chose to lie and they were still trapped in that greed and that inability to be transparent. And you know, there's something here about the importance of honesty in community. Because if Ananias and Sapphira had felt that they could be honest in that community, their, their life legacy could have been like Barnabas. Are we honest in the communities that we're in? You know, in our life groups, it's a great place to be honest, but we can all go deeper and we can all get away more honest. We all edit what we say, don't we? We'll say, this week's been a challenge rather than I've been a nightmare this week, you know? And I love the story about, um, you know, from Cleo and Vince about the pillow in, in Lidl, it's so real. We get grumpy, we get selfish. We, one day we have a servant heart or we're reading about a passage about being servant hearted. The next thing we don't wanna do the dishes and I know I'm doing the noisiest dishes you've ever seen and I'm whacking the dishes into the, the thing beside the sink because I want everyone in the family to know I'm doing the dishes again. There's no servant heartedness in that, you know? We all struggle with inconsistency. Let's be honest people. Let's encourage each other to say the hard things in our communities here at church 
and in our little life groups with our prayer partners and with our families. Let's say sorry. Let's ask for forgiveness. Let's ask for help. Let's be trusting God, not hustling. God calls us to trust him in the small. I know at school I struggled to trust him that my friends wouldn't all fall out with me if I told them I was a Christian or if I invited them to some Christian event. I didn't trust that God could speak to them through that event. I worried and worried and bottled out and bottled out and I still do it today at times. There's small things like that that God wants us to trust him with. And then there's big decisions. You know, I work for a mission agency and all the time, you know, we're talking with people who are having to give up jobs, give up security, give up the country that they love, give up being around their family and get on a plane and go somewhere they've never been to serve people they've never met. They're having to literally put everything in God's hands and trust that he will do the rest, as Jamie has done in his life, going to Burundi, as um, the Marais have done spending so much time overseas and others. So is our heart devoted or divided? Is our heart trusting or is it hustling? And finally, is our heart surrendered or is it still shackled? Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And that is our prayer every day. We have to choose every day whose will we're doing. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says this, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And to me, there's no better definition of what it means to surrender. You're no longer living life for yourself. You know, I'm from Northern Ireland, no surrender is a slogan you see a lot in Northern Ireland. Surrender is seen as weakness. It's seen as capitulation, handing something over weakly to the enemy. But surrender to Jesus means we are all in. We are ready to give our all. And in the giving up, we receive his power, his peace, his rest in the middle of chaos. It doesn't make sense. It's an upside down kingdom transaction. We give, but yet we get. There is no way for two kingdoms to be able to survive in our lives. It is one or the other. When I was um, a young girl, I fell for a guy who didn't love Jesus. And I knew that he was pulling me further and further away from Jesus. And I kidded myself and kidded myself for a long time. And eventually God really convicted me and said, you have to choose. It is him or it's me. You can't have both. And it was so painful and so difficult, but thank God he gave me the strength to end the relationship. And I got on a plane and went to Uganda because God reminded me, you had dreams and, and things that you really wanted to do in your life about going overseas and serving people. Where have those dreams gone? And he revived and rekindled those dreams. And so I got on a plane and went to Uganda. And you know what? That changed the course of the rest of my whole life because I discovered my calling. I ended up going to Tear Fund and who was starting Tear Fund just at that time? A young Ben Stansfield. We wouldn't have met if I had held on to that thing that I felt I wanted at that time in my life, I could have had a very different experience. And I am so grateful to God that he convicted me in that moment. But some things have got to die, haven't they, in our lives? Some things have got to die. They can't coexist with God's dream for us. We've got to let them go. And it is not easy. And it's in the small and it's in the big. Where are we surrendering this morning? Where are we still shackled? Mark 8 says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Barnabas and the believers got this. They got that they weren't really giving up anything at all. They were just allowing God to free them from anything that would hold them back. And you see this amazing contrast after the Ananias and Sapphira incident in this chapter. What do we see? We see the apostles going to prison. We see them getting a flogging. And then we see that they leave the flogging incident rejoicing. I couldn't believe it. I almost looked at it twice. It was like, does that say rejoicing? They leave the Sanhedrin rejoicing because, and it says, they um, were, had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
that's why they were rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name you see the contrast ananias and sapphira are obsessed with saving face they're obsessed with it how we appear on the outside the apostles are rejoicing because they've been disgraced for jesus i mean isn't that incredible so we have the freedom to choose what we do with our fields our fields come in different forms don't they you know the gifts that we've been given the friendships we've been given the opportunities we've been given the resources we've been given we have a choice as to what we do with them are we holding on to them are we grasping and greedy and not getting the big picture of actually god is calling us into his massive kingdom dream like barnabas we we're being called to step into something not step away from something we've been called to step into this amazing calling where we are being used we can bless others we can be part of an amazing family where we get a glimpse of what god is wanting to do here on earth that's what we're being invited into Jim Elliot, I don't know if many of you have heard of Jim Elliot and Elizabeth Elliot, two other heroes of mine. He was a missionary, felt called to Ecuador, as did she. They went to serve the Alca tribe. Um, they knew it was dangerous. They basically, the, the five men went to meet some of the tribe to try to share Jesus with them. And they were speared to death by this tribe. They were killed. Age 29, these young men that had their bright future ahead of them to all intents and purposes to the world, it looked absolutely bonkers. What on earth is that about? Why were these guys left to die? Do you know what happened? I'm sure many of you do. The wives of those guys who lost their lives that day moved to serve and love the tribe and live alongside the tribe with their babies. They stayed and stayed and planted churches. Lots and lots of people came to Jesus. That tribe began to plant missionaries, plant churches out of that one little community that had been unreached where Jim Elliot lost his life. There were thousands of people became Christians out of that. And still today, from Ecuador, it spread up into other parts of South America. Churches were planted the whole way up into Central America. And the legacy of his life lives on today. The mission agency I work for now, Latin Link, was birthed out of what his life achieved in South America. You know, we think we're giving up so much, but actually we are gaining so much in God's kingdom economy because it works in a completely different way. Jim Elliot said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose lose I'm going to finish now um but how do we do this this is not easy simply we can spend time with jesus and ask him to show us how our heart is doing spending time with him every day praying inviting him into the rooms of our heart to show us where is the clutter where are we divided not devoted where do we need to surrender what is it that uh, we need to be letting go of spending time in worship allowing the words to soak up spending time in his word you know i read something this week that really struck me the goal is not to get through the scriptures the goal is to get the scriptures through us
and see where God wants to highlight that to us today in love. Let's just pray. Father, thank you that you know how messed up and flawed we are. You know the state of our hearts. They need a good scrub, Lord. And we pray that you would be, we'd, we'd let you do that this week. We'd let you come in through your word, cleansing us, purifying our hearts through time with you, Lord. Would your Holy Spirit speak to us now and show us where we are to be changed and cleansed and renewed. Thank you, Lord. Amen.